Well, uh, good afternoon and welcome again to our Wednesday webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, whether you're watching this live or as a recording off our website later on. Uh, my name is Tim Ferguson. I'm part of the ministries team at Baptist Together. Uh, do you use a chat box, by the way, if you uh, want to tell us uh, uh, where you uh, are coming from, where you're listening from, and uh, we'll, uh, it's good to know to who's going to be here uh, joining us. Um, our webinar today is going to be led by Diane Watts, the Baptist Together uh, Faith and Society team leader. So in a moment, I'll hand over to her and I'll see you again at the webinar's end. But before we do that, uh, I do just want to uh, tell you what's coming up. Um, next week's webinar, we're going to be looking at the issue of domestic abuse. So that's Wednesday, the 10th of June, 1 p.m. And we're going to be joined on that occasion by uh, Rachel Stone, who is the Baptist Together safeguarding lead, and also Becca Legg from Restored, a domestic abuse charity. So that's uh, next Wednesday. Not a webinar, but something else I want to advertise is uh, a quiet day. Many of you might be practiced at going on retreats, but you may find your local retreat center is closed at the moment. So we're hosting a, uh, an online day retreat um, well, from five hours anyway, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And they'll be split into five sessions. There'll be an introduction and then some activity for us to go away to use to pray and reflect following that introduction. That's going to be led by Jeff Colmer and Beth Powney. And um, the details, as usual, are all on our webinar page on the website. Do have a look. And I also do just want to advertise last week's webinar. So if you didn't hear Paul Fiddis, Sally Nelson and uh, Anthony Reddy talking about what we are as church during lockdown, how do we do church in the virtual world and theologically, how does a church change or not change according to our circumstances? Do take a listen to that recording from last week's webinar. It was a great conversation. I recommend it to you. But I'm going to uh, clear out of the way and uh, hand over to Diane, who's going to introduce both our topic and also our guests. Hi, thanks so much. And thank you. Thank you, Tim. And uh, welcome to everybody. It's uh, a delight to be able to join you uh, this afternoon. More delightful is the fact that we are, go we are joined by um, two people to help us negotiate what is a, a really um, important topic particularly relevant at the moment, um, and, and one that I think many uh, ministers and people within churches are, are facing. So I'm joined by uh, Vanya Jean-Baptiste, she's a, a Baptist minister, and uh, has currently a bereavement counsellor too. And um, so I don't, I, oh, there we, we, we have got her there, thank you. Um, so hi Vanya, it's great that you've been able to join us today. Um, and also um, Pete English, who is working for the Listen People Project as part of At A Loss. And I know she, he'll say a little bit more about that and um, give some more information on that and, and some of the resources from that too. So um, welcome to both of you. The aim really of today is to be able to not just um, share stories, and we're going to be doing some of that too, about bereavement and, um, and about grief at the moment, but also to explore some of the issues around bereavement, grief and loss, particularly at this time. And um, wanting very much to, to be able to ask the questions, well, how does that uh, help us to, to respond practically to some of the issues that we're facing in our churches and in our communities? So we really need um, to hear what it is that you want to know, what you would like us to talk about. So please do use that the live comment uh, box to ask questions. If we don't pick them up during the session, we will going to have a, a nice good slot at the end. So anything that you want us to to reflect on, to talk together about, it's very much very important to hear your voices. How we can help is the focus of what we're what we're talking about today. So first of all, welcome Pete, welcome Vanya. Um, Pete, do you want to just say a little bit about the listening people? and what you've been doing, and um, just to introduce yourself a little bit, and then I'll come to you, Vanya, if that's all right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Diane. It's good to be here. Yes, the um, Listening People Project is part of the charity Atalos, uh, which is a signposting service for the bereaved, atalos.org. 
And um, my main work is training churches and youth workers to support young people who have been bereaved. Um, and as a result, either of bereavement or uh, of parental separation. Thank you. Um, and Vanya, just tell us where, where you're, you're based at the moment, in which part of the, the country you're in and what, what you're up to and yeah, a little bit about you. Hello, Diane. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the That's webinar today. Um, my name is Vanya John Baptist. Currently, I'm the minister at Stroud Green Baptist Church and we're based in North London. I've got experience of working in the bereaved, working with the bereaved. Previously, I worked at Caris in Islington with the bereaved and also at the North London Hospice. I'm not there now, but I do have a background in um, supporting and working with bereaved people. That's great. Well, thank you very much indeed. So um, we're going to begin to this afternoon by just reflecting on what we've um, some of the terms that we've been using. So already I've used three words. I've used a bereavement, grief and loss. And they're quite different things, aren't they? So I would be great if we could um, unpack that a little bit. Um, Vanya, do you want to say just a, something about loss as opposed to bereavement? What's the difference between those two things? Well, anything that you'd like to, to reflect on with that? Well, as you said, Diane, um, some of these words that interlink and interchange with one another. Um, in bereavement, there are other losses to consider during this pandemic. Um, when we think of bereavement, it's actually um, bereavement is, is, is what defines the loss to which the person is trying to adapt. And in bereavement, there are other losses to consider, as well as the loss of a loved one. Um, there's a whole range of things that we need to think about when we're looking at the issue of loss. Um, loss comes in a variety of shapes. It comes in a variety of forms and sizes and with different, different degrees of intensity as well, I'd say. And people may be also struggling with the loss of, of freedom. In the current pandemic, our freedom has been taken away and people have been complaining about being prisoners in their own home. Um, loss of routine um, and what that means for, for people. Um, loss of one's job. People's businesses have crashed. Um, during this pandemic. So they've got a, a source of income, loss of their income, which will affect their lifestyle. So you then have the added loss of one's lifestyle. Also the loss of one's role and one's identity can be covered under loss and legal status is also coming under that. We also need to also think about the um, physical and emotional aspects of loss as well. One's um, physical health and mental health um, are, are, are can be considered as loss. Uh, 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 I mean, for instance, I had um, uh, one of the members of my church, if I can briefly say, um, who's who's under, um, uh, she's having to self-isolate initially. She's an elderly member. She's lost her routine, her structure and all what have you. And it's starting to affect her mentally to the point that she's ended up having a stroke. So it's affected her physical body. So the mental loss of um, one's mental ability and also the physical um, aspect of loss when the body becomes sick because of stress and because of the loss itself. We also have to do with the loss of motivation, um, loss of the meaning of life and the purpose of life, which a lot of people are asking a lot of questions around at this moment. We also need to think about the psychological aspects of loss. For instance, people um, uh, who lose their confidence when they're facing the loss of a loved one and what that means for them. Losing one's self-esteem and one's self-worth. Um, one's emotional stability, one's happiness, all comes under issues that can be covered by loss. So it's a really broad aspect. Also, yeah. we also need to be thinking about the spiritual aspects where one loses one's hope and one's faith, questioning is there a God at this time in life? If, there, if he's there, what is he doing about what we're going through? So the aspects of losing one's hope and losing one's faith um, comes, in, comes into it. And also when it comes to dealing with loss, there are four main phases of grief. Again, the word grief comes up, which may or may not be um, have a chronological order. They may overlap or switch about, but all of us must experience in some degree um, these four stages if we're seeking to move on with our loss. If I can briefly say what they are, is that okay? If I briefly yeah, absolutely. And then we, we, um, we might come back and, and unpack some of, the, some of the things you've already talked about. So that'd be great if you take us through those okay. four stages. Thank you. Okay. So I'm um, going to quote J. William Worden. Um, he describes them as the four tasks of mourning. So mourning, grief, bereavement, loss, they all inter interlink and interchange. So William Worden describes the four tasks of mourning then, or if you want to say the four stages of grief, 
he describes the first task as being able to accept the reality of the loss. And at this stage, people can be in a stage where they're in denial. And the symptoms that can arise from this is the shock, the disbelief, the sense of unreality. Is this really happening or has this really happened? And the method that would probably take them through is helping people to maybe um, face the loss. Um, for example, taking them through various rituals that perhaps they might need to go to. And also really just a simple basic thing of providing a space for them to talk about their loss. The second task that Worden describes is helping people to work through the pain and the grief of loss. And this is a really painful stage in the, in the grieving process. And symptoms that can arise from that is anger. You may have guilt. You may have feelings of um, worthlessness, um, feelings where you feel like you're searching and you're yearning. And, and the, what comes with that is the weeping and the raging. And again, the talking about the loss. And also at that stage, you're really giving people permission to grieve because quite often you can ask someone who's grieving, how are you? And they'll say to you, oh, I'm fine. You know, I, how are you coping? Oh, I'm fine, but really they're not. So it's about just knowing and giving them that permission. Yeah, it's okay for you to, to lose it. It's okay for you to cry. It's okay for you to express what you're feeling. So that's the second task. The third one that Worden talks about is to adjust to an environment in which the deceased is missing. So this is the phase at which you start to now realise that, look, the person has gone and that they're not coming back. And this is another difficult stage that, and the symptoms that can arise from that is depression and apathy. So how you'd work with someone if you were supporting them and walking alongside them um, is you'd help them to resolve maybe the practical issues of coping with their loss. That, do they need help with um, paying a bill or going to the post office or going to do some shopping for them? So helping them to deal with the practical aspects because the depression and the apathy can cause them to have a lack of energy and motivation in wanting to do anything and even wanting to move on in life. And, and finally, the fourth stage that Worden describes is to emotionally relocate the deceased and to move on with life. And this is the stage at which the, the, the bereaved person accepts the fact that the person has died and they're not coming back. So it's acceptance. And the symptoms of that would be um, the bereaved person being ready to engage then in new relationships and activities. And you would help them do that as you walk alongside them. What you do as a bereavement supporter is you'd help them to explore what those new activities might look like or what they might be. So that's very briefly, I've said it very quickly. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Mary. I, and I recognise that we've got a short time and there's so much in that. So we really appreciate yeah. you doing and, and taking that th us through those stages. It's really helpful. And, and also for reflecting on that, that loss can be more than the loss um, of somebody physically, but the loss yeah. of things like job security, freedom and so on. Um, and of course, that will affect people in, uh, in different ways, won't it? And um, Pete, I wonder if you want to say something about loss for young people at the moment, because that's been very much in your area. Would you like to just yeah. say a little bit about what you observed? Yeah, I mean, just agreeing with everything that Vanya had said and um, just thinking about um, young people. Um, one of the things I think about young people is, uh, look, I think about my year 11s, you know, just about to do their GCSE, suddenly they're not, you know, working mm -hmm. all that time. And loss and bereavement. Bereavement means to be robbed of something or somebody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many people, and we, the thing about this current situation, we're all in it together. So, you know, we're all either not going to the church office or uh, things have changed. And William Worden talked about adjusting to a new reality and accepting new stuff. Well, we're in this as well. So for young people, getting their heads around this whole change, for, for anxious young people, it's great. I don't have to go into school. That's a good thing that's changed. But then I'm stuck at home with these people that one of the tasks of a teenager is separating from your parents and spending all your time with your friends. Well, they couldn't. And then you throw a bereavement into that pot and um, it's a really difficult time. Thank you. So um, in terms of practical help, I mean, Pete, what sort of practical help can um, youth workers, pastoral workers, ministers, community workers give 
for young people at the moment. And um, and I do say at the moment in the context of being uh, in fairly restricted environments ourselves, what, what sort of just one or two things that you think practically we might be able to help with? I think for youth workers, just maintaining contact is really important. I and mean, there's a lot of safeguarding issues around how you communicate with young people, but um, 318 and uh, Youthscape have got some great guidelines around that. Recognising that not all young people want to do Zoom meetings. We've yeah. lost a few. Um, and so it's finding other ways, you know, sending a card, whatever, whatever it needs. We posted out battery operated candles, you know, those ones you get out at Christmas with a flickery mm. flame. And we light those together um, in our youth group. Um, practical help. I was thinking actually um, for churches, get in touch with your uh, with the crematoria staff and the funeral directors because they're having a tough time. Just send them a box of biscuits or do something, a card. Um, but for young people, uh, maintaining contact. Uh, many churches are doing great stuff. You know, they're they're doing their online youth group or whatever. Um, just keep keep doing what you're doing recognize you will lose some because they don't want to be online right thank you yeah that's that's helpful and and Vanya in your experience as a leading a church at the moment as well what sort of some of the practical challenges have have you faced um for both loss of maybe it could could be about people losing jobs or security um, and bereavement, the loss of uh, friends and family. What sort of some of the, the practical challenges that you've had to face um, as, a, as a minister in that? Um, for me, um, the practical challenges begin um, in the hospital, takes place in the hospital. Um, this was, a, a, I had a, a, a member of mine who died, um, a member of our church who died um, having been infected with the coronavirus. Um, and when the patient died, the family were not permitted to view the body, um, nor were they permitted to take part in any practice that brought them into contact with the body. I spoke with the daughter of the deceased who informed me that um, her mother's body was placed in a body bag and um, with just a label attached to it. and um, she wasn't even sure that if, if it was actually her mother that was actually mm. in that bag. So she, this was quite traumatic um, for her. And, and the, also the nature of a mother's death has been quite traumatic and has made everything doubly difficult for her. Um, and, and, and I think it's hindered the, um, in how she's processing her emotions and her feelings around her loss and her grief. Um, following you. on from this, um, we also think about the practical challenges of of um, arranging a funeral um, and, and um, you know, with the full, there's so many restrictions when it comes to the um, arranging a funeral now during this current pandemic. Um, we're, we're, you're only allowed a limited amount of mourners um, to attend. The committal service usually provided for mourners to, the opportunity to let go um, of the person who's died and, and helps bring home the reality of their bereavement. It, it, they're not being able to to do that because there's just a limited amount of mourners. And, and I also believe that in, in viewing the body, um, this help makes the death more real um, for the individual. And so the prevention from, um, from them doing so can hinder the actual grieving process itself. Mm -hmm. So really it's around um, arranging the funeral and hospital visits and all of the restrictions that are around that has posed a real challenge um, yeah. for, for but, um, for myself as well as a minister, but also for the people that I've been talking to who are experiencing bereavement at this time. Yes, thank pandemic. you. Thank you. I, and, and I think what you've just described will uh, be a familiar story for many people watching. And they are also have, having to face some of those. And um, I know you would have been telling us um, that you have come from a Caribbean background. That will be particularly yeah. important for some cultures yeah. to view the body. Um, yeah. And I think it's being aware of that, isn't it? Yes, in absolutely. some of those challenges, are there things that you can suggest that people can do not to make it all right, because, of course, it's not going to be, but are there just little things that could be done, maybe just being aware of something or talking about it, other things that you could suggest that negotiate some of these difficulties at the moment? 
I think what I found helps is that finding time to actually talk, because when you think we're under all of these restrictions, we can't do anything else. We're so limited. And I'm struggling with this as a minister, just not being able to do the things that I feel God has called us to do, not being able to really physic be a physical presence with people. So I think, you know, use the telephone and come alongside people and share your experiences, um, because quite often people just need to know they're not alone in what they're, what they're experiencing um, you know, and, and there's someone else who can understand what they're feeling and what they're going through. Because I think with this isolation and lockdown, it's making people feel even more isolated and lonely. So I think, you know, the simple basic thing of let's just pick up a phone and talk to people, keep talking to people, share your experiences with them. Even your own experience as a minister, um, if you've you know, we've all been through bereavement in one form or another and have suffered loss in one form or another. Share those experiences, you know, and someone might just want to hear hear that and it, it will encourage them that and reassure them that they're not alone in this and there is someone else who can understand what they're feeling and what they're experiencing. So talking, um, I feel, is really vital, especially as we can't seem to do too much at the moment. Um, obviously, mm. when the restrictions have lifted, then we can be more practical in the way in which to, we look to help um, people who are bereaved and, and really maybe just ask people. Because one thing I found really helpful is not kind of asking people um, or saying to people, let me know what I can do for you. I think what we really need to rephrase the way we say things to the bereaved and, and possibly say, ask them, well, what can I do for you? Um, because a bereaved person is hardly unlikely to lift up a phone and say, look, I need help. You need to say to them, you know, what would you have me do for you? What can I do to help you? As opposed to let me know. Mm. because that's that's not enough sometimes just changing a little bit isn't it changing pete. our language exactly thank you yeah. uh, pete do you do you want to say something a little a little more about a uh, bereavement for young people uh, and i know that uh, maybe thinking reflecting about where your experience has been in the past but also now in this current pandemic and perhaps also looking to the future of what you're you might be concerned about yeah, I mean, I do deliver training around this, and um, you can get in touch with me. You know, especially you know you've got your youth workers who value that um, bereavement for young people. I'm sort of throwing out all the theory books at, at the moment because everything's changed so much. I think it's going to get delayed. But just I was talking to a young person yesterday who had had a relatively distant relative who died. Um, and they were asking me what what will happen to the body because the funeral's been delayed, and she said, won't it get a bit smelly? And uh, we had this conversation about just telling her in you know, factual terms what happens to a body, and she said, "Oh yes, it goes into a sort of refrigerator." I've seen it on these crime programs, and that sounds really like oh my goodness, she was sharing this with a young person, but that's what helped them. They needed to know so it's important that we encourage families to talk i mean i'm i run listening people you know so i'm bound to say that but talking and honestly and using the proper terms it's always you know, with young children you know grandpa hasn't fallen asleep uh, jesus hasn't taken him you know grandpa mm -hmm. died um using the words uh yeah things like that really right. Written, I've written a, a journal called um, Tough Stuff for bereaved children and young people would be appropriate for, say, 11, 10, 11 to 14 year olds, um, which that's available. OK, yeah. thank you. you. You talked about you think bereavement might be delayed for young people. What, yeah. what do you mean by that? What, what are you what's your concern and what should we be looking out for in the future in that case? Some of my concerns are that it's not possible to go through the rituals that um, Vanya talked a little bit about this. Um, I'm just looking at some notes, actually, that I pulled off. Um, the, the psych psychiatrists are expecting there will be issues around this and it will make grief complicated because um, traditional grieving rituals, saying goodbye, viewing and, bur and burial of the body are absent and physical social support is lacking. So those types of things, I think, are going to just put things on hold a bit. And mm -hmm. accepting 
Vanya talked about William Wood and you know, accepting the reality of the death. You know, if you're watching a funeral on your TV screen being streamed, I wonder if it will sink in that it's actually happened. Mm. So all, it's so hard because we don't know what, what's going to come out. We need to be prepared. Um, but listening all the way through, listening is the thing. Right, thank you. So in that terms of being prepared, um, and obviously there's been a lot of planning, people are thinking about, you know, the future and um, as well as having to inhabit the space we're at, how can we um, plan? Can we plan? Can we be prepared for what might come if we don't really know what's going to come? Yeah. Or are there things that we could be looking out for? I mean, I wonder, Vanya, if you could say a few things that perhaps we, it would be helpful to be looking out for in the future if bereavement is delayed or as loss begins to really kick in a little bit? I think first of all we'd need to start out with listening, listening to where the bereaved people are before right. we even start to think about making plans, think about where they are because even now as I kind of um, today um, I know someone who's kind of walking with guilt because they weren't able to give the deceased the funeral that they 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 wanted, they weren't able to honour the person um, and celebrate the person's life. So they're walking with guilt, um, which they shouldn't be, but they are. So I think the first thing that we'd need to do again is about just, just listening to where people are at and then maybe look at how we can put things in place to help them move on. Um, and, and, and maybe it, it might be just to start to go to think about the, the four tasks of mourning and the stages and the process because it's different for everybody um, um grief is people experience it differently so um i would begin with maybe you know looking even within our congregations and our communities where are people at before we can even begin to consider how we can move forward and how we can help them because there are many ways we can think of of helping them we can set up support groups um refer them to counseling but i think we need to when we go back to our churches meet with these people, talk with them, listen to them, see where they're at, and then see how we can best help them and take the steps on from that. So listening is going to be, it, we've, we've heard it time and time again, yeah. that we don't have all the answers, but we can listen yeah. and help build from there. Pete, do you want to add to that at all? Is there anything you particularly want to, to just, just thinking about the future? Yeah, I think there is stuff out there. I mean, bereavement care awareness training run by yeah. loss and care for the family has been around for years. Um, that is being done online, so there's more of it being delivered. It's all on the Atalos website. Um, there are online bereavement courses now, the Bereavement Journey course, um, mm -hmm. originally run by HTB, but run by Atalos is out there. Um, I, I love what St Paul's Cathedral has done as far as um, almost like a remembrance online remembrance book so pictures of the bereaved are posted onto the website i put the given tim the link to that um being ready and just listening and we can't fix grief you know yeah. it's so tem a lot of training is around this it, it, yeah. just listening is the thing it's not oh i know what you've been through etc etc you know, it's just listening and not having to, or even as Christians, not having to feel we have to add a Bible verse, um, mm. you know, to what they've said. Yeah, so it's, it's permission to just to walk a journey with somebody, um, even the, the virtual walking, if we can't be together now. And, and I think that might be for a little while in the future to see how things go. So it, it won't always be a, a quick thing. Yeah, Vanya, sorry. I, yes, do. Can I just say in. something, just to touch in on, on the Bible verse, because sometimes, well, in some cultures, you know, people view grieving as a sign of weakness. And they'll use certain scriptures sometimes. I've had it said to myself, they'll use certain scriptures. That, you know, I've had it said to me um, on one occasion when I was dealing with loss, oh, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Or things like time is a healer. Or don't worry, you'll get over it. And and it's not none about, because again, I want to go back to this thing about changing our language. And we can't, We like you, something you mentioned earlier on, Dan, about giving people permission to grieve in their own way. Um, whether it's 
we're of different cultures or we do things differently, but allowing people and giving them the permission to grieve in their own way. Because, um, uh, you know, sometimes people say, like I've said before, oh, don't worry, you'll get over it. And grief is not something, or losing a loved one is not something you get over, but you work through and it takes time. It's a process. Some people take longer than others. But again, I go back to this listening to people and maybe looking at changing our, our language when we're working or looking to support people who are bereaved. That's really helpful. Thank you, Anya, because sometimes um, as ministers, we can we can feel nervous about doing something wrong. Um, and yeah. so it's really helpful to give people permission just to listen um, and, and also being um, aware that there are going to be differences according to different cultures. Um, but it's OK to still be in that place. Is, is that Absolutely. what you're saying? That just to listen, Absolutely. to walk and not provide the quick answers. I don't think many people want to provide quick answers, but we can sometimes feel that we need to say something and that's not always Absolutely. the right thing to do, is it? Thank Absolutely. you. And can I just very yes. quickly add, when you're saying about saying something, it's okay to stay with the silence. When we're working with Thank the bereaved, you. it's okay to stay with the silence because sometimes that's what people need. Yes. And silence is a hard thing, isn't it, for, it is a hard for, thing. for ministers who've always liked to talk, and now we tend yeah. to do that. So, <laughs> so, but thank you. Just sitting in silence with someone is so important, isn't it? Thank yeah. you for reminding us. That's great. Mm. Pete, did you want to add to that? I know you. I was just you. reminded. I went and grabbed this uh, tough stuff journal. We put a page in there called. Um, uh, I think it's something like bereavement bingo, and it's tick off all the all the phrases that people might say to you and then come up with some better ones. So the things like, you know, the awful things that Banyas had said to her, you know, it's, uh, God's taken them away or whatever. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, listening is the thing. And just, uh, I think we're gonna have, to, it's gonna be six months down the line when we right. see the effect of complex grief Yes. Yeah, so what Pete was just saying that um, he thinks it could be six months down the line um, when the effects of complex grief might begin to hit. Yeah. Um, at least six months. Um, I think when we uh, found ourselves in this position back in March, um, we probably had no concept of timescales. Uh, we are moving into different timescales now, aren't we? Um, we've, a lot of what we've talked about today has been uh, walking the individual journey with people. But the, there are some times, and I think uh, Pete's referred to it a little bit when you're talking about St Paul's Cathedral, whether we can um, enable more corporate grief. And I know that's going to be something that schools or maybe youth groups will be wanting to, to think about. And how do we help communities to grieve more broadly? And that doesn't just have to be schools or youth groups. That, that's going to be all sorts of groups in churches. Um, Pete, do you want to just say a little bit about your experience of, of helping groups of people in a more corporate yeah. way and then perhaps Vanya as well if you're, from your experience too? Yeah, most of my experience has been working with schools and helping schools set up bereavement policies and there's great stuff from Child Bereavement UK um, that if you work in a school you can point the head teachers towards that but it's a really difficult one to balance and I don't know how it's going to work out in schools how you balance the providing the support I think one thing that happens in corporate grief, you can play the, well, I knew them better than you knew them card. Mm -hmm. And also you've got people who are grieving. So for young people, if they lose that YouTube star that they followed for years, that's a huge loss for them. We might mm -hmm. think, so what? You know, you never knew them. But to them, it's, you know, we, we followed them on YouTube. We've done all our makeup according to that person or we, we've learnt the martial arts move of that person. And, you know, if they die, then that affects them. Thank you. That's really helpful to, for us to be aware of that. Vanya, do you want to say anything at all about um, corporate sense of grief or how we could help um, groups through that? I think what can possibly help that we can maybe look to for the future is maybe setting up um, bereavement support groups um, where people can um, you provide a place for people to come and share their experiences and explore their feelings with other people who understand 
and listening to the experience of others so that, as I said earlier on, they don't feel alone. So bereavement support groups, in my experience, have worked really well, especially in churches. And it's not necessarily anybody needs any training um, to put one together. Again, it just provides people a, a space to come together as a whole and just speak about their experiences together. And Thank especially you. If you're thinking no, no, that's great. I, I, some really practical ideas as well. And, mm. and I think you mentioned about opening a, a, a grief book or a bereavement book. That might be helpful. Yeah. Um, and maybe also sharing some ideas around what it's felt like to, to lose. And it's not just uh, losing people, but losing your job. Being aware of that is a in itself a, a grief process, isn't it? That there's yeah. um, freedom and that all sorts of things going on around some of that. We're going to come and, and, and chat a little bit about our own self-care at the moment. But before um, we, we do that, I just want to encourage anybody who's watching to uh, do pop your questions down or your reflections. I'm more than happy to pick some of those up if there's anything particularly you would like us to, um, to, to address. Uh, and again, if, you, if there are things that you've seen, touched on some of the things that we've said this afternoon, then please do just add it to the, the chat box and we can talk about that. Um, Vanya, you mentioned right at the start that actually we're all, I think you both actually mentioned this, that we're all in this together, that we're learning together. So I wonder um, if you can give any uh, ideas or, or hints of how we can look after ourselves um, in this process as we help others to grieve, uh, to grieve at the minute or, uh, or we help others to face loss. Vanya, do you want to just say a little bit about that? Yeah, and um, what I found with, with this current pandemic as a minister is that we've kind of, we've not had any kind of training to help us to deal with um, bereavement in this kind of environment. And um, we've had to kind of learn as we're going along. We've had to hit the ground learning and, and be learning new things. So that in itself has been a challenge. So um, what I find that in our desire and willingness to kind of serve others, we can end up taking on uh, more than we can cope with. Um, so, um, I would say that we need to be mindful of our own limitations, um, be, be very mindful of our own limitations, be aware of our own coping mechanisms. And if those mechanisms are not in place, we need to find alternative coping mechanisms because this is quite a, he a heavy burden on mm. ministers at the moment. Well, on everybody, the whole country and the whole world. And I'd also um, say, you know, seek help and support for our own anxieties and, and where necessarily. And, um, not to be afraid to ask for help. Um, sometimes we're carrying the world on our shoulders. We think that we're just, people think we're super spiritual beings and we're not. Um, so <laughs> be, be, be kind of humble enough to just say, look, I need help. I'm not coping and, and, and know where to go for help, you know, and, and, and talk with one another, share one another's experiences, talk about the things that work and the things that are not working. And again, it's about us sharing and, you know, letting each other know that we're not alone in whatever the struggle is, um, but talking and connecting, obviously doing the things about taking care of one's health, the basic mm. things of eating well, sleeping well, making sure we get regular exercise and resting. And the most important thing of all is spending time, restful time in the presence of God. Yeah, it's the basics, isn't it, that sometimes when we get very busy, we forget. And it is the... Yeah. the uh, exercising, spending time with God that gets pushed to the back when everybody else is, is calling on our time. And, and thank you for reminding us of that. That's really helpful. Um, Pete, do you want to say anything a little bit about how we, we look after ourselves in, in this time um, yeah. as we help to support young people too? Yeah, um, I think is a tendency. You, you think you'd be a superhero and you can look after lots of bereaved people and um and we just can't we're all different you know and our yeah. ability to cope differs from person to person mm -hmm. um i found um i i subscribed to the association of christian counselors magazine and they they had something on self-care yeah. they had this um, questionnaire about compassion fatigue and burnout and i put the link the link will be on on um at the end of it but I, I, ran, I went through this with my supervisor and just checked that I wasn't burning out, that I was still coping. That I wasn't suffering secondary trauma from what I'm hearing. Really useful questionnaire. But you need to, obviously you need to trust the person that you're going to go through it with and be accountable. But right. I'll check. 
Thank you. So some really um, helpful ideas about finding other people around you to support you at this time as well. Um, and it sounds like that those are um, a mutually supportive relationships as well. So you can have those friendships. You can phone up someone and say, actually, this is how I'm feeling today. Um, we, we have one question coming in from Mandy um, asking if you have any particularly good models for bereavement groups, um, just general things, nothing particular, but other particular things around bereavement groups. Pete, did you want to say anything around that? I've just joined for the first time um, an, the online bereavement journey group and um, they're small, smallish groups, but they were full. There's a waiting list for people to get on. It comes with a guest manual. Um, online it, bereavement journey. Um, yes, the, the bereavement journey. It's the all bereavement on, journey. Okay. It's on the Lost Hope and the Atalos website but really good, about six people, um, and they're split into the person that you've lost. So the per the group I'm helping with, they've all lost a child at whatever age, so they all have something in common. Thank you for that. Thank you. Vanya, you, you talked about uh, bereavement groups previously. Um, do you want to say anything a little bit about that, uh, that you've seen work well? I don't have any models to hand at the moment, but I have seen where they do work well. And people have come away feeling very positive and very encouraged. But I think one of the main things that they come alone, come away not feeling that they're not on their own and they're not struggling on their own. So, but I haven't got any models um, that I can give to you today, but I can let you have them. Um, Thank you. When I dig them out. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really helpful. Thank you. I think one of the things that, that you said, Vanya, was um, actually you don't need any special training to get a no. group of people together in a room for a cup of coffee and encourage them to chat. No. Um, and begin to talk about the. Um, do you find that some people find it easier to chat than others? Um, because we're, we're thinking about when we're talking, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to encourage people to talk. Not everybody wants to talk, do they? It might, not everybody might want to join a bereavement group. There might be some people who are just not joiners. Um, how have you found helping people who, for whom actually a bereavement group? would be the probably not what the thing that they would want to necessarily do um well as a bereavement counselor i provide them with one-to-one -one bereavement counseling but i think if you're not trained and you may want to think about just helping people with the practical aspects of the things that they need doing um looking and seeing where they're at um in the practical sense and walking alongside them and supporting them that way that in itself um speaks volumes but if you're not trained um i think that's the way way forward is just you know what does this person need and how can I help them and can I walk alongside them to help them do this thing and then what you find is as you're walking alongside them on a one-to-one -one in that sense in the practical sense they may open up to you but it takes commitment as well um we need to be kind of committed to doing that it's it's not just about asking people how they are and yeah you know it takes commitment and it might be that you need to walk alongside them in that journey for a while. I may need to go to the shops with them for a while. I may to need to help them to do their shopping or whatever it is for a little while. Um, and just being there for them in that practical and physical sense. Um, and then what can happen is as you show your commitment to them, they may um, open up to you and share with you. Because quite often what I've found as well is that people find it difficult to actually talk to their family, um, other family members who are grieving. So having someone outside of that family loop can often help as well. So that's something to be considered. Thank you, that's really helpful. Now, obviously we're in a situation at the moment, and I think this is a question that's just come up, is that actually it's very, we can't get together in a room at the moment. We are very limited. Um, we're, and particularly for uh, ministers who are themselves are having to self-isolate or, or um, have been shielding. Are there any particular things, any advice that you could uh, give to ministers given the current situation? Um, you know what? Pete, well, sorry. No, go on, Vanya. Sorry. I'm sorry. To, <laughs> I've I've learned the beauty of using technology. And before I used to be, I'd be honest and put my hands up and say I had a fear of technology. And my children tell me, "But, Mum, you're okay." But inside, I think I fear technology. But I've learned to use Zoom, which is amazing. You can get so many people together in a room online. There's um another one called House Party for younger people. Um. And you can use that method as well. There's a Microsoft Teams. Um, there's even the basic WhatsApp groups that you can um, stay connected with. I mean, WhatsApp um, 
initially when you were doing a video chat with WhatsApp, they only allowed four people. But now because of the pandemic, it's gone up, I think, to, to about eight people. So there's yeah. other ways that you can use technology. I always say use what you have. We've got we've got nothing else, but we've got to use what we have. Use our computers, yeah. use our telephones. There's ways around around it somehow. God has provided ways for us to to be able yeah. to still connect, which I That's think great. is great. So yeah. I know it is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Pete. I guess it's worth just um, you know if you're a minister phoning somebody up or a youth worker. If you're a youth worker phoning the individual, you need to check safeguarding rules around that. Yeah. But, um, Checking where they are, where are, are they in a place where they're going to be heard or disturbed? You know, can you arrange it so that you ring after the kids have gone to bed? Things like that. And also recognising this isn't the same. Um, there's something on the BBC website about there's a very slight delay when we do Zoom and this type of conference. And it can make our brain think that we're being slightly disapproved of or rejected so there's little nuances like that and we can't communicate so fully when we're online so recognizing that just saying it out loud that this is a bit odd isn't it but let's see how we get on here silences are quite hard because we also will allow for silences and we do and I was talking to my supervisor this morning I got cut off twice with a client the other day online so we, we didn't know, was it a silence or have you been cut off? So you have to sort of work that one out as you go along. Yeah. Negotiating through through around Zoom has been something we're all having to learn very rapidly, yes. aren't we? Yes. And, and, and that's right. I think one of the things that I'm hearing um, both of you saying, but just walking the long journey. I mean, Vanya, you were talking about, for some people, it might just be the practical part of things, which actually we can do. You know, just doing somebody's yeah. shopping and leaving it on their doorstep if you are in a position to get out, then that's really helpful. Does it always have to be the minister? What's your experience of, of within churches helping each other? How has that worked out and what have you seen work well in the past? Vanya, do you want to say a little bit it, about that? It, I'll answer the first part of that question. Oh, sorry. No, yes. <laughs> it, does not, it does not always need to be the minister because we're a, we're a community, aren't we? A community yeah. of God's people and we reach I mean my church has been brilliant in how they've been reaching out before the lockdown restrictions got really um really heavy um what one particular member was doing was taking um someone um doing someone's shopping and leaving it on the on the doorstep um I went to collect the medication for one of my members and then put it through the letterbox so it's little things like that um another thing is another member is helping another member to have a walk every day now that we're allowed to to meet with one person and just having a walk every day and then taking them back home so um my church have been brilliant because it's i i, I serve at primarily an elderly church so but they've been brilliant in looking out for each other so again it's picking up the phone what can i do so as the restrictions are being lifted little by little okay so more people can gather so we work around that and we stay connected we've got a stay connected group and we literally um plug information about each other on that group so everyone knows what's going on even the elderly um I, I let them know what's happening with the elderly who don't even have um, a smartphone. So everyone knows what's happening with everyone else. And they'll pick up a phone. If someone, one of our members recently is going through a bereavement who's lost a friend of over 60 years, place, I placed it on the Stay Connected group and immediately he was getting phone calls from, from everyone. Mm. So it's, it's again, it, even if you haven't got the modern tech form of technology, as with my members who don't even have a smartphone, you know, just ring the house phone. There yes, are ways yeah. to connect with people and we need to just keep doing that and letting Thank them know you. that they're loved and that they're still in our thoughts and, yeah. It just, it, it's just something really simple as that, isn't it? Thank you. It's that simple. Yeah. Pete, did you want to add to that? You, yeah. I just wanted to add that the support mustn't stop after, you know, up, up to the funeral, great. What about after the funeral? Right. You know, first anniversary, what about the fourth anniversary? You know, must maintain some form of recognition that this is hard. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's been a theme that we've heard come time and again, um, all the way through what you've both been saying today, is that it, it is walking the long journey with somebody, isn't it? 
um, and, and but not being not giving them all the things of what they're going to do or what's going to happen, but just being there as a support and listening. Um, we're, we're drawing to a close now. I mean, are there, and is there anything that we've not um, covered? Something you'd like to, to share or to say as we as we close now? Um, I don't know if there are any other questions if anybody wants to get in, but hopefully this has given an opportunity for thought and for reflection for others as well. Pete, is there anything particular yeah, that you wanted to that's very finish good. on? Uh, look after the youth workers. I've had two not connecting with my church nationally um, in tears on the phone, feeling quite isolated. So just, you know, make sure your youth worker, if you've got one in your church, are doing OK. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Just seeing another question, sorry. Um, uh, I think we've got somebody who was talking about uh, sorting out a funeral um, and how hard that is. Um, and, and it's very difficult about just seeing that. I don't know if any of you are able to pick up some of those questions. Uh, doing funerals is a really hard one, isn't it? Um, yeah. it, it, it the, 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 the minister was in the drive in the hearse um, in the road for a few minutes. It just sometimes driving past the house makes a difference, doesn't it? That's that's helpful. Thank you for that. Yeah. Manya, is there anything particular that you wanted to, to raise to I say as we say, finish? Yeah, just um, not to forget our elderly folk, because when we come out of lockdown, they're going to still have to shield and decide um, how they self-isolate. It's going to continue um, for them. And we need to look at how we do church with them and for them and that they're not forgotten, basically. Thank you. Uh, as we finish today, you both raised that that thing. Let's not forget. Uh, so look after our youth workers, um, and let's be also be aware of those who, uh, even if some of the shielding restrictions come off, people are very very nervous. Yeah. And we go back to where we began, didn't we? Uh, uh, what does it feel like to be in a position of loss? Because that's not going to suddenly change. So. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, both Sanya and Pete. It's been absolutely a real privilege to be able to, to chat with you both this afternoon and uh, and to draw on some of your immense experience. And I just pray a blessing on, on your work and all that you continue to do in, in the places where you're serving. So, so thank you for that. And, and to everybody who's been watching and who maybe who is picking this up after the event, um, I hope this has been some help to you. And um, please do keep talking to us as a um, Baptist together if we if you've got other thoughts or things that would be helpful for us to to deal with or to to share more broadly across our family please do let us know um, but I'm now going to to pass back to Tim as he uh, finishes off today thank you well thank you uh, Diane and uh, Pete and Vanya for, for the input uh, just to say yep yeah, the links to all those resources that were mentioned and there were quite a number uh, mentioned they will all be uh, on the uh, website and the webinar page uh, shortly after the webinar give us half an hour or so and we'll have those there and um, just a quick reminder as we conclude again that we've got uh, the subject of helping those facing domestic abuse is our webinar topic next week and a reminder lest you weren't here at the beginning of the webinar that we have a, something quite special coming up on Thursday, the 25th of June, which is a, an online retreat or an online quiet day led by Jeff Colmer and Beth Powney. Again, the details of what that involves and how to access it are on the webinar page. So do take a look at that. Finally, as we conclude now, our prayer broadcast once again happens tonight at seven o'clock with Lynn Green and Jonathan Vaughan Davis from Bethel Baptist Church in Cardiff. That's seven o'clock on the prayer broadcast page. You can get to that from there. So thank you again for, for viewing and for commenting. Uh, do send suggestions in how we can improve these webinars. Although if you want to say something about the fact that people are appearing and disappearing from the screen, uh, that's just my fault and getting pressing the wrong buttons. So uh, don't bother telling me that. I already know it. Uh, but thank you for, for taking part to give us your suggestions. And for now, I'll just say uh, God bless you and goodbye.